Okay, hello again for our English lesson. All right, you ready for your starter? We are looking at commas. Now, they look a little bit like that. They sit on the line, they're a little dash. Now, what are commas used for? Why do we use commas? There's a couple of reasons. Have a quick think about a couple of reasons why we might use a comma. Right, a couple of reasons why we might use a comma is, take a breath. It's not like a really long breath, like a full stop. But it's just a quick breath, just a quick breath. To make a list. Now, some people always forget about this. One of the uses for a comma is to make a list. When I went to Cornwall, I bought a souvenir, an ice cream, and a great big teddy. You don't necessarily hear the breath, but it breaks up the sentence into the list. And after a fronted adverbial. Now, we learned about fronted adverbials the other week. So the week before poetry, we looked at fronted adverbials. And we always make sure that after a fronted adverbial, there's a comma. So we're going to recap where the comma goes after a fronted adverbial. So we already know what verbs are. They describe how something is being done, when something is being done. Um, so here are some of the commas after the fronted adverbials. As soon as she could, so that's telling me when, the time. As soon as she could. Chrissy ran out to play. Occasionally, comma, mum would allow us to select a sweet in the shop. That tells me how often, how often is my mum letting me take a sweet from the shop? In the distance, okay, tells me where, where is something happening? As fast as it could, tells me the manner. How's he doing it? Well, he's doing it as fast as he could. Completely exhausted might be the degree of sad how something happened. So, oh, Holly clambered out of the pool. Now remember, they are normally at the front. So just have a think about where that breath might go. So these are going to be in a form, and I'm going to put play, I'm going to put commas in different places, and you're going to make sure you tick the right ones. So it's going to be multiple choice, but I might put the comma here. I might put the comma here, I might put the comma here, and you've got to make sure it goes in the right place. So you can either pause the video and do your form now, or you can carry on with the rest of the lesson and do it in a, in a bit. Okay, we're looking at our type of text. So it is going to be non-fiction, but it's going to be persuasive. So we're going to identify some persuasive language and comment on the effect of the um, on it to the reader. So when we use persuasive language, how does that make the reader feel? And we're going to see how that language maybe manipulates the reader to think, oh, well, maybe I should do that. So when you're trying to persuade something, so I want to first start off thinking about what that word persuade means. Can you think of any texts which might persuade someone to do something like, you must come and do this? Can you think of any examples of where we might see a persuasive text? What does it mean to persuade someone? Have a quick think. Now, to persuade, I'm just going to look at my definition here that I've taken off of Oxford Dictionary. To make someone do or believe something by giving them a really good reason to do it or by talking to that person and making them believe it. So I could try and persuade all of you that aliens are real because of this reason and this reason and this reason. So I could give you some really good reasons why aliens are real. So I'm persuading you, persuading you that aliens are real. Now, here are some texts which um, are persuasive. So I've got the Five Palms Hotel. Are you ready for a family fun in the sun? If the answer is yes, it's exclusive Five Palms Hotel. So I'm trying to persuade someone to go on holiday. Come, come to our hotel. Special offer book before the 27th of January. <laughs> Should children wear school uniform? Mm. In many countries around the world, it's compulsory for children to wear a school uniform. So it's an argument. It's saying, hmm. And then also, this is the sort of text that we're going to be looking at planning next week. And this is adopt a puppy. How much do you love me? So it's trying to persuade someone to give to charity, to try and help them help that poor little dog out, help the dog's trust out. And that's what we're going to be looking at, endangered species. We don't need to think about that until next week. We're just looking at persuasive for now. Okay, now what does Miss Evans mean by persuasive? language how does it manipulate the reader 
Can you believe that we, by using different language, you can change the way a reader feels? So these are things that you've got to look out for today. So listen up. You've got to look out for words like surely and obviously. Now have a think, how would that make a reader feel if you saw something like, obviously, this is a no-brainer. You must accept this decision right now. By using that word obviously, it makes the reader think like, oh, maybe it is obvious. Yes. So it entices them to think like, oh, of course, surely. It's like a guaranteed thing that is gonna that is gonna be believable. You've also got perhaps maybe even quoting statistics. So with something like I've put in as an example here is 98% of people would agree it's the best holiday ever. So a non-fiction persuasive writing might quote statistics. They might say, two million animals have already been destroyed by the rainforest. So it could be a statistic. What? How would that make a reader feel? How would that make you feel as a reader? Would it make you want to believe it? Yeah. If you see some real life true facts, I think it would make you believe. You'd, you'd believe it, wouldn't you? So it makes it a bit more believable in that non-fiction. So you're not just persuading them on, on something that they don't know because you're telling them the facts. You're telling them statistics. Quite often, they might use emotive vocabulary. Now, have a think about that word emotive. It's got the word emotions in it. So it might have words like sadly dreadful, angry. How would that make you feel as a reader? Would it make you want to sympathise with them? If you're reading something about that poor dog's trust, sadly, 30 dogs have been lost in the area. Whereas if I just told you 30 dogs had been lost in the area, you might not feel sad. But by saying the word sadly, 30 dogs have been lost in the area, it makes you feel sad. Okay, so it sort of sparks emotions. How exciting is it that you can come to this great hotel? So if I just said, you could come to this great hotel, I might, like, oh, okay, yeah, I could. But then it's like, how exciting is it? It makes you feel excited. It makes you feel those emotions, so emotive vocabulary. Now, you may have heard of this, you may not. This might be something brand new. A rhetorical question. Now, I bet that sometimes your parents ask you rhetorical questions. Now, a rhetor can you say of me? Rhetorical question. Now, you, um, some these are questions that don't actually need an answer. So most questions you say, have you done your homework? Yes, I have. That's not a rhetorical question because they want, you to, they want an answer from you whether you've done your homework. Whereas if you had something like, can you believe that? They don't really want an answer from you. They don't want, yes, I do believe it. Or they don't really want, no, I don't believe it. Okay? What are you going to do about it? Okay, they, they don't really want an answer for you. But as a reader, it would make you think like, oh, dogs are missing. What am I going to do about it? Well, I'm going to sponsor the dog's trust. And it makes you think about, about, it just makes you question yourself. It's a, it's a horrible question. Last one um, is that it might be over exaggerated. When you are trying to persuade someone to do something, you might over exaggerate. So it might be something made out better than it is. Quite often, there might be an exclamation mark. So it might be an exclamation sentence. It will absolutely amaze you. Okay, it's, it's a bit over exaggerated. So it's not going to say, yeah, it's pretty good. Because it's not going to persuade me to want to go there. But if I make it really over exaggerated, you'll be like, yeah, it's going to amaze me. Yeah. So, how would that make the reader feel? Well, if you over exaggerate about something, then it makes you feel excited. Trust me, teachers do it all the time. <laughs> we might over exaggerate something like, hey, I've got this brilliant reading comprehension for you. Woo! And I might over exaggerate it to make you feel a bit excited about it. <laughs> so it's over exaggerated. Okay, right. What I'd like you to do 
you're going to have two texts. Now, one of them's an easier one, and then one of them's a little bit harder. So you can pick which one you want to do, either the easy one or the hard one, or you can do both. And I want you to try and pick out some pieces of um, persuasion, some language that's persuaded you. You might find a rhetorical question. You might find some emotive language, so something that excites me or something that makes me feel sad or something, uh, some, some language that uses emotions. Some statistics. Is there something that tells me that this is the most amazing thing ever because lots of people have told me or because there are so many different roller coasters? Is there a statistic? Over exaggeration. Have they gone over and above to make this thing sound amazing? And words like surely and obviously. Okay. So I just want you to write them down. Try and spot. Try and spot up to about 10. Up to 10. So like that's the. That's the max, maybe. Okay. <laughs> Good job. Have fun reading our little bits of um, text and finding some persuasive language.